How's everybody doing today? You know, thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Kevin Frazier. I'm co-host of Entertainment Tonight. Um, we were just down on the red carpet, um, getting ready, doing our show, shooting um, stuff for the Grammys, and we were talking about Whitney because we had a bump in and you hear her singing, and we were talking about how there's no mistaking that voice, that beautiful voice that changed the world and changed music, and you know, there's noise out there, you hear the noise, but the voice always cuts through, and that is something that we always have loved about Whitney. So thanks for coming out today. This is a beautiful celebration here. We thank the Houstons, we thank Gary, we thank Pat. And yes. I wanna bring up our panelists right now, and um, I wanna start with Pat Houston, who is um, the keeper of the flame, man. A woman I love so dearly. She has always been um, the voice behind the voice. Mm. I also want to bring up Gary Houston. Come on up here. Um, I just want to tell you a quick, I just got to say, I love telling this story because um, I was, when I was in high school, my favorite basketball team was this team at DePaul and I loved the players and I wore number 24 my freshman year because my favorite player was Gary Garland <laughs> so I'm like you know I'm hanging with Pat and I'm like oh hey Gary how you doing and Gary's like yeah I used to play at DePaul I was like you played at DePaul when and he's like I was like Gary Garland so he had to take me out. We had to shoot some jumpers. I had to see the jumper again. Another, I, I lost my mind that one of my, the guy, the reason I wore 24 as a freshman in high school is that guy right there. All right, anyway. A great shooter. Um, when you talk about limitless talent, like people who can move in and out of things, that's where Ricky Minor comes to mind because this dude, if it's not one of the major award shows, it's any show out there. He can airdrop in and he can make it happen. I've never seen somebody, they're just like, they throw music at him. He's just like, I got it. I got it. It'll sound perfect. Whether it's country, western, or hip hop, Ricky Minor does it all. Ricky, come on up here. <laughs> So, whenever you do something like this, you also get to learn. And um, man, when you listen to someone's music, you grow up listening to someone's music, you're like, well, I look at you as an artist more than I look at you as a producer or a musical genius, a man who can move things and do things. That is the soundtrack for many of our lives. But that is what Neurona Michael Walden has done. Yeah. He was there in the beginning, and uh, we're gonna talk about your association with Whitney, but come on up here. Woo! 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 Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. And then finally, Gary Chambers is here today. Gordon Chambers, I'm sorry. Gordon Chambers is here today. Uh, yes, that's you. We're, yes, sir. We're, okay, there you go, oh, thank you. Um, Besides the music, forget the music, didn't you share a birthday with somebody? Yes. You shared a birthday with Whitney. Will you come on up there too? Yeah, come on up there. October 12th. October 12th. October 12th. With you, with Gary. Oh, wow. Do you have a jumper? Can you shoot, can you shoot it like this? Dude? On the piano. But thank you for coming and being a part of this. Um, First and foremost, and I'm gonna start with Pat down here. The voice. When you think of Whitney's voice, what do you think of? When you hear that voice? It's just extremely angelic. You only wanna hear that voice. And I feel so badly sometimes because when I hear other performers and I'm listening, they sound, they sound so good. That's, I'm always saying, they sound so good. But when you have Whitney's voice, you know, in your head, you're like, there's no other. 
you know, and there's so many special entertainers out there, but none not quite like Whitney's. So angelic, and angelic is beautiful. Gary, you grew up with Whitney, so what was it like watching her develop? What, when did you know, like, she's really special? There's so many magic moments, uh, one moment in time situations uh, when she was growing up. As a, Three, year, three, three years old, she was in the basement singing my mother's wig, you know, broom, Ooh. gown, <laughs> high heels, and I was watching, and she, she, was, nobody, she thought no one was watching, she was just singing, mimicking my mother, reading from all that. So I had some kind of idea, you know, that she was going to be, you know, a prodigy, but um, not like, not like it became, it really didn't, so. So you thought, oh, so I said, oh, there's some potential there. I thought I was better than her anyway. <laughs> so you was, thought I, you were the singer in the family. I was older than her. So, uh, she mimicked me, she followed me, you know, a lot, you know, so I, you know, I thought I was really, you know, she was just trying to keep up with me, you know? Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I want to ask this question. Narada, I heard you didn't, at first, you were going to pass on working with, you were like, ah, oh, you got a call and you were like, oh, I, I, I may not have time to work with Whitney. Is that true? True story. <laughs> I passed on with Zoom Houston because at the time we were doing an album with Aretha Franklin, The Freeway of Love, who's Zoom Who, and it took my attention so strong that to work with anybody at that time was no. But it was Jerry Griffith, that Arister, who was so um, pushy. And then he said to me, hang on, Sissy Houston's her mother. And I thought back to my own record of Garden of Light, she sang background and killed it. There was a little 11 year old girl sat in the corner, that'd be little Whitney. Then I realized the power. And then I said, okay. And then she came in and sang. Then we did How I Know. <laughs> <laughs> and it blew you away. Whitney on How I Know blew me away. I'd never seen a singer of so much power and have so much confidence and look at you like Muhammad Ali. Mm. <laughs> like, do you hear that sound? <laughs> and uh, the sound was awesome. And for her to hear her own sound and in the room with her, it, I just never, I never, I never saw anyone look at me like, "Are you hearing that sound?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ricky, I want to ask you because the energy. What was it like? Harnessing that and putting the music behind one of my favorite things is if you have a chance to eyeball Ricky during any show He doesn't stand around. He's not the guy who just stands there and play, plays the bass or keyboards or whatever He is always moving and I love it. What was it like in the in harnessing that energy and Finding the musical sound to fit Whitney's voice So I think that um <clears throat> happens very rare that uh, a special spirit comes down and it happened to be vo her voice in this case, but she could have done anything, you know, and I think that she had this um, ability to be right in the center of where she is. So when it came to work, she could really do it. And what's so crazy about it is she didn't have to work for it. So that's a, that's a hard thing. It, it was already there. You know, there's nothing that she had to learn how to do. It was already in inside of you. And that doesn't always happen. This gift here, and then a path to, to let the world hear it, you know. But with that comes uh, a lot of responsibility and a lot of weight. And so I think that what's important for me um, is to, let everyone know that where her heart was, because there's a lot when you step in, step in front of a stage like that. But I think that, you know, she was silly and and uh, and it came easy, so she didn't have to work hard. And you know, what was it like for you? Because y'all were young. I mean, and you, when you connected, what was that like? Yeah, I think I think the the first time I met her, I, I was. Um, 22 and she was 18 wow. and uh, I got a call from John John Simmons her music director at the time and we had met you know actually through through Gladys Knight 
uh, you know, because that was my, was my first job, professional job was with Gladys, and I happened to meet her, her music director, John, who was working across the street with Stephanie Mills. So did he call me and said, I got this girl, and she's trying to get a record deal, and we're coming to LA, can you put a band together? And, and we did a showcase for Clive Davis, uh, and he had just signed her, and, and Clive wanted everyone to see her here in LA. And uh, so he brought all, all the producers out to kind of listen to her sing. And she was, you know, so fired up. She did, did three songs and, and we did it actually right here at uh, Vine Street Bar and Grill, right here on Vine. It's so right. Right. That, that, it was there right where the Trader Joe's is now. Wow. But that's where the showcase was. And, um, and I just remember Clive saying, uh, coming to the stage before he introduced her, he did a whole thing about her and Sissy and everyone. And he said, um, mark my word, you're looking at the next superstar. Wow. What do you remember? What is, like, <coughs> when you think of Whitney, what is the memory that jumps out to you, Gordon? Well, there's so many memories. Um, there's the memory of working with her and producing songs on her Just Whitney and her Christmas <laughs> albums. Um, in the early 2000s. Um, there's the memories of hearing the great hits that this legend, give it up one more time for this man. But, you know, growing up as a teenager or, you know, listening to records, listening to your solo album, but listening to those great productions and thinking one day I want to do that. You know, so there's, the, there's me, the listener. There's me, the boy from Jersey, growing up in Teaneck, New Jersey, and, and meeting Gary when I was, I think I was about 19 or 20 when we both were at a showcase. and singing in college at a showcase that his mother um, judge was the judge for a town hall. So it's a whole story of being sort of in the shadow or the arc of the Houston family and the legacy. And the, finally the dream, you know, came true. But the first time, you know, when I think about Whitney Houston, I don't think just about the voice. I think about the human being. I loved her. To know her was to love her. And she was the most loving, kind, warm, sincere, generous, supportive spirit. You know, they don't make people in this industry very often that had that kind of integrity, as a human integrity, that kind of warmth and kindness. And, you know, every time that I came, that I met her, you know, I'm, I was at um, a party that Gene Riggins gave, gave, remember Gene Riggins from Universal Records? And I went to this party and um, Bobby and Whitney were there and then I said, somebody brought me to say hello to Bobby and then they said, and Whitney's here also, and then he said, and Bobby was like, wait a minute, you wrote I Apologize for Nita Baker? You wrote that song? My wife loves that song. He said, come over here, and brushed me over to the table, and she started singing my songs for me in my ear. And then when, the, when we finally got to the studio to do the first record, I said to her, I said, wow, it took me years of submitting songs to Clive and to Arista before I finally got something accepted when L.A. Reid was the executive at Arista at the time. And the very first time we first had the first studio session, I said, wow, I have waited for this moment for a long time. She said, no baby, I have waited for this moment for a long time. That's the love that I remember and the, the, that's, that's what I love to talk about when I talk about her. The human. The human. Speaking of that human being, Pat, what was it like traveling and the moments that you all got to spend away from the spotlight? Wow. She was always very, she was like a little sister to me, but I would always try to keep things separate. I never really liked to fraternize that much, but it was kind of hard to balance that, being her manager and, and being her confidant and being a sister-in-law. But um, we did it. We had very private moments of playing tennis and I would beat her uh, <laughs> at every turn. I told her, I said, girl, you can't whoop me. You know? <laughs> and, but with swimming, she get me every time, you know. So it was a lot of swimming, a lot of private time. Um, she was very spiritual, you know. We read a lot of scripture together. Sometimes I'd get tired of it, you know. But uh, she was very, um, a very loving, peaceful, and she loved peace. You know what I'm saying? She loved peace, regardless of all the noise that was out there. She loved peace. And those moments were moments of sisterhood. You know, she was always there to 
not look down on a person. When you look down, she's looking down to pick them up and nothing mm -hmm. more, to pick them up. So she was all about helping others help themselves and I love that about her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary, you, you know, you have a chance sometimes to, when you're in Vegas to perform in the Whitney show and what does it mean to have that moment? It just brings back so many <clears throat> special moments with me and Whitney. We had so much fun um, growing up and singing together, uh, not just on stage at that level uh, of, uh, of performance, but man, we'd be in the car and we'd have we'd have performances in the car, me and her. You know, I mean, just uh, sitting in front of the house. Uh, I was telling someone earlier that um, um, I would teach her some songs, you know, songs of new artists and you know, guys, and, and I would forget the songs and she would remember. Song. I said, I don't even remember these songs. And she just had that, 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 that instinct, man, you know, and, and, and the knack of just always. She couldn't remember her own songs, but she could remember. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she remember other people's songs. But it's amazing. But uh, I had so many special moments, so many uh, memorable moments uh, when it comes to uh, just singing, having fun, not in front of anybody, just me and her. It's like we, were, we had an audience, you know, me and her were one another's audience. Ricky, what were some of your favorite things that you all would do when you were putting music together, whether it's on tour or for a show? Well, you know, I think that the most memorable <laughs> things are me presenting something to her and, and she right away saying, nope, <laughs> I'm not doing this. No, come on. She says, I can't do that. You know, like something like that she didn't want to do, but it's, the thing is the gift, is there so she could do anything and and I think because of that she you know nothing really challenged her because it's you know and so if she found something to challenge her because she could do it it would mean some effort on her part it's something that that's <laughs> not good. I got you. <laughs> good but I think you know I mean like even with with um with I will always love you um you know the, the whole story behind that and and the whole where the, the song that was chosen uh, for the end credit yep. was What Becomes of a Broken Hearted. And, and Fry Green Tomatoes came out and they had already licensed it. So they had to pivot and find another song. Uh, and so uh, David found uh, I Will Always Love You and that was it. And, uh, and they had recorded it. Uh, David had went in the studio and recorded it. But um, mm -hmm. it was Whitney's decision to say, I want to do it live and, and bring Ricky in and, and the band in to do it live. And we recorded that live at, uh, at the Fountain Blue. How many takes? Well, we did two takes. Okay, I, we, I heard like, one, I heard no, one. Well, no, no, okay. we, we did two takes, but what everyone heard is the first take. The second take was just for safety. And it's the same thing with the National Anthem. I mean, mm -hmm. she, did, she, she came into LA and, and this is when she had d done the uh, screen test for, for, for the movie. And, and uh, so the, the NFL requests that you do a safety, even if you sing it live. So she came to do it and I sent her the recording and said, did you listen? You know, I was really excited. And she said, uh, no, just put it up, it'll be fine. So I played it one time for her, she listened, she sat there and said, okay, I got it. And she goes in, she does it, and there's nothing really to do. So I just had to do it a second time, just you know, just because she was already warmed up, and I used just just a little. I used, I used Rocket Red Red Glare. It was a little more powerful than the first time. That's the only change. You feel that when it's the magic, when you know the like in your. What's it? Is it like you know maybe when LeBron's on a roll or yeah. you know? Yeah, you don't you know you, you don't tell Picasso how to paint. So there's like there's nothing you can tell her do this or don't do this or hold this note longer, she had that instinct. She knew exactly what the song needed. And again, she, and, 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 and all, all these folks here, and everyone uh, out, out here will know that. Pause. Go ahead, plane, do your thing. <laughs> but everyone knows that, that, you know, she had instinct she knew exactly what so you don't have to tell her anything she knew it innately what to do and that's the magic of her and each time that she's that she's saying is different every single time because she's singing from a deeper place not from her head but from her heart it's a bigger place it's a bigger exposure because 
in that moment, you're vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, when 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 you sing from this place and not from trying to impress someone, because generally, if you yes. if you're doing a whole bunch, then you're probably not doing anything. Not doing anything. Exactly. You know. I want to ask you, Gerard, about going at the second album in those songs, because you have a monster. You have an album that feels like once in a generation. That's it. That second one is tough. How did you kind of face and ramp up to make that second album a success? So Clyde Davis invited me to his bungalow at the Beverly Hills, and he played me five songs. I wanted to have somebody who loves me as one of them. Where about Harris goes another, uh, a few other choices he was thinking about, and then I played for him a song that Preston Glass had composed. You see, tonight, called um, uh, "Love Is a Contact Sport," and he liked that song. So, in doing the second album, we were very smart to have a great team of Randy Jackson, Preston, Walter, my team in the Bay Area, and we would recut the demos in a style that is what you hear on the record was for Whitney. And even put vocal and background just so she, she, when I would get with it, she could hear, not the demo, but her record. And that would be the thing that would turn her off. Oh, now I'm getting this. You see? And I would ask her, I would say, are you at all nervous making a second album? I have a sophomore jinx. And she would say, no. If they loved me the first time, they'll love me now. And that was so cool. To, to be able to relax and make great music. And one more thing I want to say, we would work quickly. Every song was always done in a three hour time. Because I knew she had to go here, go there, go there, everywhere around the world. So three hours was the, was the time. Really focused, really focused. So you got in and you locked in and it yeah. was. And the main thing, what, what, what Ricky's saying is true. It's hard, but then she's got these different voices. Yeah. She's got that power voice you all know. But then she has a, the head voice, the sweet one. But then she's got another voice that can connect those, those voices. Yeah. Mm, so yes. what we would do in recording is experiment on different sections, those different voices, to see what would be the way that would be the sound that would last the most, because we pray to have longevity. She had longevity. Oh my God. Yeah, she did. But what was it like for you in the studio? Ooh, um, <laughs> like I said, this was a dream come true and you know, when Joey called, Joey Arbergé was like, Gordon, we're gonna, you know, I'm, we're gonna accept your song and you're gonna go down to Atlanta and you're gonna cut the vocals. So I'm like, okay. And even though I had recorded with Gladys, I'd recorded with Shock, I'd recorded with Brandy, I'd recorded, you know, with some amazing, Anita, some amazing singers. You know, this is the voice. This is the Whitney Houston. So I was like excited, but nervous, but she was so cool. She was so relaxed so fun so warm she calmed me down we prayed i remember one of the things i remember so well about her is her handshake she had a very firm mm -hmm. handshake she would touch her hand and she would pray and when she grabbed your hand she said the, the lord is you know she would come. she knew i think that she knew her star power and she knew how to calm people down i think she could int intuitively feel when you were a little bit intimidated by her and she would use that humanity in her to relax you that generosity of her heart to calm you down and really make you comfortable. And then once we got rolling, we had a good old time. I mean, we had fun. You know, I think we probably extended our sessions longer than they needed to be. Indeed. <laughs> because she said it wasn't indeed. my fault, but, you know, but we had so much fun. We had so many memories and we would talk, you know, Whitney would come to the studio. This wasn't a three hour Whitney. Whitney might come to the studio for sing for 20 minutes in the 2000s and talk for three hours because she, wanted to talk about music. She wanted to talk about Gladys and talk about Abby Lincoln and Betty Carter yeah. and Dakota Student. I mean, really, Phyllis Hyman. We had lots of conversations about Phyllis Hyman, who was my first mentor. She was a music lover, loved Shaka Khan. So every time I saw her, whether it was in the studio or at Pat's house <coughs> or at a, at a party, we would talk music. She talked, she loved gospel. She, she loved my music. You know, she played my, solo, my little solo records. She knew the songs and played them. She's true. If I could say one thing, true music lover, like for real, for real, for real, and so much information in her head about music. So when she went to record something, um, she was bringing the information of, of those who she studied to that to, to nuance that recording. Musical genius, just a genius. 
I love that you mentioned the fun side of Whitney. Cause, uh, Pat, what was, there was a performance she did in Vegas at, an, at one of the award shows. It was like Clive brought her back and she was performing and I just started at Entertainment Tonight and I was backstage and I didn't think, I just that Whitney was coming off the stage and so I started running over towards Whitney and there was a group around her and she had a towel over her head. And for some reason, I just reached out and I touched her arm, I was like, hey, Whitney. And as soon as I touched her, I was like, damn, bro. <laughs> and she stopped, and she took the towel down and looked at me like, who in the hell is this touching me? <laughs> I like Kevin from ET, I just want a couple of words. And everybody looked at me like, Whitney's got it going, are you crazy? <laughs> and then she said, no, hold on, hold on, stop, stop. What do you want to ask me? And I was just got quick questions. And I started stumbling, but it was Whitney, and that was the moment, and that was, it was, that was the person that I, I felt shine through at that moment, Pat, that the, the fun side of her. And I, I think of being in Detroit on the set um, with Whitney at Sparkle. Yes. In the church that day. And you remember that day, and her performance that, to tell everybody what it was like that day in Detroit, because that performance was unbelievable. First of all, the entire time that we were in Detroit, she was impeccable. On she was time, the mama. Yeah, I mean, on time, it was so sweet. But the church scene, it was close to her heart. Um, she was singing His Eyes on the Sparrow. And I remember David Mann, you know who he is, the gentleman, yes. uh, Tamala, Tamala Mann's husband? Tamala. Yeah, Tamala. He was sitting there and he was just looking at me. I said, what's wrong? He said, I'm waiting for your reaction. I said, I'm waiting for yours. He said, I have no words. I have no words. She had the ability to make you stop doing what you were doing when, you, when she's singing, which will, we will rewind back to Las Vegas when she performed. And Clive, I believe it was the uh, yeah. World Music Awards. Is that yeah. not correct? Yeah, World Music or Bill, but one of the two. But yeah, I think, I think it, it might be World Music. World, world Music. music she hadn't performed in a while. She hadn't been in the studio for a while. And Clive was nervous about asking her to perform. And when he asked me, I told him, I said, she's fine. You know, as long as Whitney would tell me that she was fine, I didn't need anyone else to tell me anything because I trust what she tell me we had that kind of relationship she didn't want anyone on that trip she didn't want her husband she didn't want her child she just wanted to deal with at the moment Gary and I so it was just anytime she had a major major performance quiet time meant a great deal to her so that performance she knew she was going to be coming back and she was going to be in front of her mentor industry father and she wanted to make sure that she was perfect and Donna, you might remember, on rehearsal, Ricky, were you there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the rehearsal was so perfect. I mean, you could hear a pin drop in the room. Everyone was in awe because so much was going on around in Whitney World that wasn't so positive and people were really shocked to hear this woman perform at that rehearsal the way that she did. But it was crazy. It was crazy. Like everybody lost their minds. They're like, wow, that's Whitney. That's Whitney. From Celine Dion to Patti LaBelle, she wanted everybody to move out of her way so she could get to Whitney's, Whitney's dressing room. Move out of my way, I, I, I've got to see her. I, I mean, it was that grand, mm, you know. So when Whitney, it wasn't that she had anything to prove. She just wanted to let the world know, I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still here, and I'm still present, and I'm still going to make a difference, and she did. I still thank her to this day for not just screaming on me, for <laughs> grabbing her while she was coming from her biggest moment. And I'm like, hey. Whitney, <laughs> let me let me pick it back on okay, some of that uh, fun stuff because uh, I had so many fun times. But you know what really amazed me when Whitney and Ricky would be arguing so, <laughs> I mean, so intensely, but they loved arguing with one another about getting the job done. 
and I used to sit there. I was on the outside looking in and inside looking out. So what I'm saying is that there are times when I, I mean, I've had so many funny times, but those were the times, and she'd go with me and laugh, we'd laugh, I mean, we'd laugh, but laugh. I would stand and watch them like, and they would, and, and the end result of every argument, he would get what he would. He would get. He would. He would. He would. He would. And she would too. So it was equal. It, 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 she. It, it, they were equal, but not always identical. You know what I mean? So what I'm saying is that they got stuff done. They got it done. But the argument was so intense sometimes. You know what I mean? He wouldn't. He wouldn't back down. Because that you, you couldn't back down from her. Because she would. She would. She would, she would go at you. Go at you. And he was the same way. He said, "Listen, I knew what I got to do with her. I know how to deal with her." And that, and he got stuff done. The, 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 one of them mattered that. He got stuff done. He got the best out of her. Because he was bringing the best, and, she, and that's what he, all he wanted. You know, so I, 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 it amazed me. It amazed me. The level of, it was <coughs> funny to me, too, as well. And it was funny to her, too, but they were serious about, you know, <laughs> making their point. <laughs> you remember those moments, Ricky? <laughs> Do I? <laughs> yeah, I, I still have, uh, you know, March from those. Uh, <laughs> no, no, the bottom line is this: and uh, she she knew that uh, from from hello from the first time we met, mm. and uh, and she was like a sister to me. So you, you're gonna not you're not gonna always agree, you know, and that's okay. Uh, and 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 she would push back on it, and I'd push more, and she'd push back, and I'd push a little more. But you know, people have seen the the. Um, the uh, I love you, Porgy. The whole mint leaf there with oh, yes. and, 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 and you know and, and everyone's seen the movie, so you know some of the story behind that. But before that, there was um, me talking about so my, one of you know jazz is one of my strong things. That's what I, I connected to as a, a young kid, you know, around 13 or so of, of music, and, and I loved listening to it. And I started taking lessons and really loved that. And I wanted to, to share my love for jazz with Whitney because she could sing anything. She in the phone book and I'd buy it. You know, uh, hey, I'm here. Um, <laughs> it's not the police though, it's just an ambulance, so I'm good there. Yeah. <laughs> so the bottom line is that I, I started talking to her about, you know, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughn, um, Barbara Streisand. So when we would do these television performances, I mean, you come out and you do the same song, you do your hit. And you do it 10 times on 10 different shows, same song, same performance. So I suggested to her that why, why don't we are sort of trying to put these medleys together. And uh, it was the, um, uh, the first ever Billboard Award. And uh, her single at the time was All the Man I Need. So I said, why don't, uh, I, I want to put together something so it's different. You know, this is the first one of this show, and this is the war season starting. So I put together uh, Lover Man, <sighs> and then uh, My Man. So Lover Man was uh, was uh, Sarah Vaughn's version of it, and then uh, My My Man was Barbara Streisand. So it's Lover Man, My Man, uh, to all the men I need. To all the men. So those three songs were tied together. And if you look back at that 91 billboard, if you haven't seen it, check it out. She laid it out. I mean, you think that that she wrote these songs and 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 she sang it like, I mean, it was just ridiculous. I mean, her phrasing, the pacing, everything, taking a breath, all that. So for me, I just have to present it and make it happen and then just follow her because she knows exactly where she wants to go. She knows when she wants to hold it, when she wants to hold back. Ricky, did you create that part when she's, he's all the man, all the man that I need. That yeah. man? Yeah, yeah. That's my That's favorite. favorite. <laughs> I mean, the, you, the, uh, the singers here and here know that man, right? Sorry, I had to just ask that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, what yeah, makes you love that? What, what, why do you love that? Because it was the it's jazz so side of her. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I mean, of all the YouTubes, like of of her, like that all the man that I need when they go into that vamp and she's in that falsetto part in the background's yeah. Gary, all the man that I need. Yeah. It's so yes. lush. It's but so you know, that came from Sissy. Yeah. Sissy started that. She she implanted that in Whitney. 
tell you, all those arrangements and different, you know, secret patients and all those, you know, segues into certain things. And, and you know, of course, Ricky, you know, <laughs> but Sissy planted that in Whitney. She had that knack yeah. for what she wanted to hear. You know what I mean? She just soak up so much sitting sitting there, you know, we were talking about her being eleven years old, sitting off to the side and listening. It all she took it all in. And it made a difference then. Right. I I will talk forever, but what I wanna know your Whitney mo like the moment. We all have a moment where you can go back over and over again. You think that's all I think of when I think of Whitney Houston. Pat, I'm gonna start all the way down with you, your Whitney moment. Whitney moment. Man, where do I begin? I, I have so many. No, um, but there, no, no, no. There, you've told a lot of stories, but there's, there's a moment. <laughs> well, <laughs> Oprah told this story when she, uh, uh, you may have heard it. It was the first time, I guess, maybe it was eight years ago, nine years ago, well, when she did the Oprah show. Whitney had such an attitude with everybody, and I try to tell her, listen, I said, karma is everything. I said, be very careful. Watch what you say now. She was still just very bitter and upset about some things, and she said, sissy, just let me be me. I said, okay, I said, I'm, not, I'm not trying to stop you. She was still a little hateful. She goes on stage, <laughs> and she trips. Oprah told that audience, not one single word to anyone. That secret was kept for way over 10 years or more. I'm telling you. That was a moment for me because I was so afraid when she slipped that she got hurt. I have to add to this. When she fell, there was a little nail next to her inches and if she had fell one inch to the left it would have went for her head Jesus Christ. so I was so fearful and so upset that she was failed but even more so because I told her karma will get you you know that bothered me for saying that but you know she came out of there so humble she did she came out of there so humble and sweet, she said, yeah. Child, you are anointed. Yeah. <laughs> she, Child, you are anointed. But I, I'm serious. Did you guys hear that story from Oprah when she... No. When she, no. no. So no, this is your first time ever yeah. hearing this story? It's that long. Oh, you've heard it, Sam. No, 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 it's been a secret that long. Well, it's been a secret for that, that long. long. But Oprah did tell it, I believe, not too long ago. But she kept that that's the power that she has. Yeah. She kept that for years, and that audience listened to her. But more importantly, it changed Whitney a little bit that day also. My favorite moment, um, there's so many of them, but this is when I realized we were at our home, and I was mad at her because she was acting real arrogant and real <laughs> cocky. And I was chasing her around, <laughs> trying to get her to understand something. And she was running around, and Pat was down in the kitchen, and I almost got to her. She ran behind Pat, and she did like this. <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to kill her. She ran behind me. Those are moments I'm talking about. <laughs> she could get away That's with. <laughs> but didn't get away with. Right. You know, as time went on. I mean, Carmex is a Carmex. You know, a certain certain behaviors, certain things that you you, 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 you you do, but you can't do, you should do, or won't do, but that was not really, I wanted to just destroy it. Well, you know what, she was, she was, she was our little, you know that for, yeah, yeah, she, in fact, she, she was our girl. She could get away with anything, you know, pretty much. Bratty, but it was okay, do you know what I'm saying? And we've, we've experienced that, how bratty she is, but still very powerful. She knew that we loved her. Do you know what I'm saying? She knew that we loved her and she thought that she could get away with anything with us. So that's what that was all she about. She couldn't with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna skip over to Gord. Gord, what is your? So many, so many. Um, in the studio, one time I was trying to get her to um, 
do, she had laid the lead, but I wanted her to stack her voice on the background vocals more. Um, and so she did two tracks, and I said, okay, that's sounding great, we need to, a third and a fourth. And she looked at me, and she had a way to look at you like. <laughs> saw those eyes, and she said. She said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Patricia <laughs> is gonna call um, the background singer that was on retainer, she said. We're gonna call her and she's gonna give you all the background vocals you need. Patricia, get Gordon to <laughs> It was like the deepness of it all. It was hilarious. But then in that same session, I was telling her to, you know, I said, well, just try it. You know, we'll, we'll add her, um, what's her name? We've toured with you guys for years. I said, well, add her, but since you're here, do you wanna just try a couple more? Just lay back on the time of the bit. She said, baby, let me tell you something, Gordon Chambers. She always called me Gordon Chambers. She said, she said I don't follow the music. The music follows me. <laughs> and, Today I do a lot of vocal coaching, and I actually use that. And I tell people, you know, be confident in your yeah. presence, be confident in your sound, Jesus, like yes. make the song your own. Like she said it humorously, but it was the epitome of who she was. When she sang something, she took command of it. Absolutely. You know, she had she had all that information and inspiration that was in her genetics, and she she was grounded in it. Another thing that so that was a, one of the more humorous things. But something, the most touching thing that she did, which when I think about it, it really does bring tears to my eyes, is one of the studio sessions we were in, I was talking about my parents, and talking about my, you know, Gary and Pat have met my parents many, many times, and, and how my love of music really came from them, because Whitney and I always talked about music, and we talked about how we loved some of the same music. She said, you talk so much about these people. She said, I want to call them. She said, get them on the phone. So I said, and she said, call them. So she had me call them, I said, mom, Somebody wants to say hello. She said, now you leave the room so I can talk to them. And she ordered me out of the room and she spoke to them for about 15 minutes. And my parents were like, I cannot believe that she just took her time to just call little old us just to get to know us. It was the most beautiful, kindest thing. Last story, and I know I'm over time. When we did the concert in Shelby, when Pat brought me to her hometown, to do a Shelby North Carolina to do a, a benefit concert for the high school. Was it what was the organization? It was for the high school. For the high school, and I performed and brought the band, and we had a beautiful performance. And um, right before I'm getting ready to go on stage, and, and and they introduced me, they said, "Don't go on yet." The video comes on the stage, and it says, "Ladies and gentlemen," um, and it was Whitney introducing the concert. Sorry, I couldn't be there, but tonight you're going to enjoy. You know, I send my love to Shelby, and I just looked up at the screen. I could not believe that she took the time to just uplift me. I couldn't believe it. And when I think about it, it's, <laughs> I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm really, truly forever touched by the legacy of her, of her heart. And couldn't, her have, couldn't have been to a nicer guy. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. And you know what, it, it is special. So always yeah, sure. let it be special. Um, Rada, what about you? What do you remember? I mean, there's so many questions I have about the music and the, the songs, but what is your Whitney moment? I am so blessed. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today in the spirit of Whitney. She loves this moment when we're all together, giving her the love. I'm so happy to have so many beautiful memories, so many beautiful memories. I have to say one thing comes to my mind is in London, she's performing nine nights at Wembley Stadium. Nine nights at Wembley, doing a fantastic job. My man is with her. She comes to George Martin Beatles Producer Studio, London Air Studios, to sing the song called One Moment in Time. This song requires, on the ending, a tremendous note that she holds. The Beatles producer came to watch, everyone came to watch, the whole orchestra came to watch, and she turned this note out so intently on the ending of One Moment in Time. It's phenomenal. I asked her to do it one more time to make sure I had the right, the right recording. And again, she would do it. So phenomenal, so long and so powerful, and when you hear it to this day, it will make you stop. I have to say one more last thing. Just down the street in another studio. She's seven months pregnant with Bobby in her belly. Uh, I'm a woman. To so see her sing I'm a woman with a belly bopping. So hard and all she cared about 
Why sound is good at Shaka. All the harmonies is tight as Shaka. Shaka, Shaka is tight. And then Nan Nicole came in and come and watch because she wanted to see that that fire. Whitney was on fire on that record. Those, I mean, it's a, those iconic musical moments. What goes through your head when you hear those songs now? Because it's, you see something different. We see the videos, we hear the music, we hear the voice. But there's a deeper level for you. Oh, for me, it's all love. Whitney had electric love. Like we have now, this feeling we have in the room of how much we love each other. It's genuine, it's sincere. This is what I love the most about her after I got to know her. How sweet, how pure, how genuine the love is. How electric it is. Alive like a fire. I have to also say, in the corner over there are the people who wrote, I, I want to dance somebody loves me. George Cheryl, George Marilyn, Shannon Rubicam. Stand up, please. Stand up, please. Thank you. Ricky, how about you? Because you have a, I mean, you've had some moments. You know, um, I was um, I was kind of reflecting and doing the Clive's Grammy party tomorrow, um, and um, just reflecting on all of the things uh, always, and I always just wish we weren't sitting here talking about this. Uh, uh, but I want to say that, you know, when, uh, when when I joined the tour and I got, got a call to join the tour and I went out the first time on the road with her and um, and the band was forming and John Simmons was the music director and, uh, and I came on the gig and everyone was from the East Coast, I think I was the only one from L.A. Uh, and I remember going on the tour and we had a, a successful tour and it was long and and then uh, when John passed away and Whitney called me and I was actually out on tour with someone else and she called and found me, because this is back you know, before iPhones. I know some of you guys don't know a day when there was an iPhone. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but you couldn't contact someone. And she you know, had them track me down and, and just said, hey, you know, uh, John's gone now and you know, I'm gonna need you. And, uh, and, and I came in and um, and took a look at everything and, and made some changes. And change is not always easy for, for, for most of us, you know, uh, especially when you don't see it coming. But I ended up changing the band and, and hiring, you know, Ricky Lawson and Kirk Whalem and other people who I thought would add to her. And I thought that in doing so, um, she was, you know, she was carrying the whole group with her voice and we needed the best players alive. Not to say that I was, but if I can hire the best around me, then maybe I could be that as well. And so, but I, I say that that she knew what she needed and she always spoke to you directly about, this is what I need, you know, or, or I need these singers, or I need this in order to do, do her job. And I think that that part of it, and then we were together uh, the day before she passed. So I'm reflecting on now I'm going to the party again tomorrow. And every time this party comes up, I'm happy to make music. But I, I hope that they change the venue one day so I don't have to walk into that same building because these emotions flow out. And I didn't, I realized that uh, it was uh, only recently that I really dealt with the fact that she was gone. Because for me, I never, you know, it was just, Okay, the funeral, go, come, go there and help with the music and help with the program, or whatever that is. Just go into action mode, but not let your emotions flow. And I, I in doing research recently, um, I sat and listened to all the stuff, and I just, I couldn't hold it back. And I know that she said to me, though, uh, you know, not that day, but shortly before that day, about the national anthem, that that's such a moment in both of our lives and we talk about that moment, which was just another gig for us because we were getting ready for a tour. We had other stuff to do. It wasn't, you know, it was like, oh, that's on the calendar now. Okay, let's squeeze it in, you know. Uh, but I, I think that just seeing her uh, at the end of that and, and 
you know, performance of a lifetime that I think is going to be, is definitely going down in history as one of the best uh, performances of the National Anthem ever. So, in the best performance of the National Anthem ever. It is, it, it is without a doubt. And, you know, it's amazing to sit here. You get, listen, if you get lucky enough in life, you get to do some really cool things and meet a lot of amazing people. And that is what, like, today is for me. To sit here with these people who were part of a musical genius, someone who changed the world, but also they helped change the world. And I, I feel so lucky to now know Gordon, but to have met all of you, to know Ricky, Pat and Gary. Gary, thanks for 24. Yes, uh, <laughs> but um, if you haven't had a chance, please check out the installation here at the Whitney Houston Hotel, which um, has been fantastic. I, I've been looking up at the, at the dresses standing here and thinking of the woman inside those dresses and the iconic moments and the performances. Thank you so much to the sponsors and all the folks out here who helped make history that are here today. Thank y'all for being here because this is a beautiful thing to get together and um, thank you to the chef for the great food I'm about to eat. I didn't get it on the first. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to taste it for it, but I will, I, will get it. I will check it out. But Pat, thank you for doing this and putting this together. Yeah. It has been amazing. Can I just say something? Um, so, and it will help you also, Ricky. Grammy week and um, Clive's Grammy party was always Whitney Stanley reunion. It was coming out to see all of her musical friends and peers. And this is a moment to really celebrate her because this was a time and period in her life that she loved very much. And this, the A-team is sitting up here right now. These are all the people that work with her that she loved, along with George and Shannon, of course, Ron Weisner, who's out there. We almost had our Easter project done. Ron, thank you so much. She loved you. Raffles. Yes, Ben Axel. I mean, we were we're 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 part of the past, but also the future. And we have another A team in the house, which is primary way. Yes, sir. That's taking us to the next level. Absolutely. You're taking us to the next level. We so so appreciate you and the work that you have done with us. But I am so so very proud to see all of you. This is Whitney's, you see how her, her arms are there and she's, she's saying, this is for me. She was just that humble. This is for me. She always wanted um, a major birthday celebration and this year will mark the 60th celebration. We're celebrating all year for Whitney because she loves celebrating birthdays. So thank you so very much, all of you, for being here to kick this off, especially to primary way pro flowers um so me uh you guys are just absolutely incredible and thank you so much guys for joining us on stage it means so much to the houston family you have no idea and kevin you my man you know that and ricky i mean i could tell stories about all of you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Then, you know, I can tell all kinds of stories about you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I just, I have to tell this one story about Ricky Minor before we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he was invited to the opening of the Cove Hotel <clears throat> in the Bahamas, and we had rented a boat for Whitney yeah. and all of her friends to join. She invited several people to join us on that boat. It was one person that showed up out of all those celebrities, and it was Ricky Minor. All those people, all those people who thought a lot of themselves. Well, wow. Gary. But Ricky, I just have to say, you, you, you mean all of you do, but this, this guy right here, I just, with everything that we have, and I know I'm speaking for her, we love you. And Nicole David, what would we do without you? Nikki? So thank you all so very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you.